Thank you again for coming to learn and hear more about uh, Oregon's marine ecosystems and the amazing marine reserve program uh, that's been kind of working for a little over a decade now, uh, just off the coast of Oregon, where we're going to hear from a panel of experts on the issue. So we are going to hear from Dr. Lindsay Aylesworth, who's the program leader for our uh, Oregon's Marine Reserves program. Also going to hear from Dr. Will White, who is an associate professor at Oregon State University and the Coastal Oregon Marine Experiment Station. We're going to hear from Charlie Plyben, who is a policy manager for uh, Oregon Surfrider Foundation. Um, so with that, I think I will kick it off to Lindsay. And then Lindsay, you can share your screen now. And then in the meantime, if people have questions or anything, please drop it in the Q&A and then we'll have around five minutes or so at the end to address those questions. Thank you. Great, thanks Ian. Uh, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to share some information about what we've been learning from the last 10 years of diving into Oregon's marine reserves. So I'm Lindsay, I'm the, the head of the marine reserves program. Uh, for those of you that may not know, we do have um, a system of marine reserves here in Oregon. Uh, and there are three main goals for why we put marine reserves in place. Uh, they're to help protect conservation of biodiversity. They're supposed to be areas focused on research. So basically living laboratories off of our coast here to be used to inform near shore management. And these areas were also put in place with um, thought behind the communities that may be um, most directly impacted from setting aside these areas with restrictions in the ocean. So thinking about ocean users and coastal communities. And it's really this community aspect that makes Oregon's marine reserves um, kind of really special in trying to balance fishing opportunity and conservation uh, need. So we have five marine reserve sites off of our coast here. Uh, and so when I say marine reserve, I'm talking about an area where there's no ocean development or fishing of any sort uh, allowed. And so those are the areas in red uh, highlighted here on the map. Many of them are surrounded by something called a marine protected area. This is also uh, sort of a place where there are some restrictions like no ocean development, but some take or harvest is allowed in these areas but not all take. So they have um, some level of protection as well. And together, uh, the marine reserves make up about 3% of state waters. And so when I say state waters, that's uh, within three miles of the shore. Uh, and then when we add in those marine protected areas, kind of together, the whole system makes up about 9% uh, of our state waters here. And together, this is really the first investment the state has done in a long-term ecosystem-based monitoring program of our nearshore waters. So our program, the Department of Fish and Wildlife is the lead agency in charge of implementation of this program. We do work together with uh, state parks, state lands, and the Oregon State Police for other aspects like scientific permitting and enforcement of these sites and areas. But really where our program um, has a lot of reach and collaboration is with community groups, university groups, conservation organizations uh, to really get our research and outreach and community uh, engagement accomplished. So we have a small but mighty team of six full-time staff uh, that make up uh, a, a little less than a, a program of $2 million per biennium, which is every two years. And so kind of with the staff and this funding responsible for doing management plans at the sites, for doing ecological monitoring, uh, human dimensions monitoring and research, which really is focused on socioeconomic monitoring and research. We do outreach and community engagement and also contract out to do enforcement work. Everything that we do in our program stems from legislative mandates. Uh, so really the Marine Reserves program uh, kind of went forth in Oregon based off of uh, Governor Executive Order in 2008, 
uh, which tasked ODFW with working with uh, community teams to sort of site the areas off the coast. So putting these areas in place and choosing where they were going to go was very much um, a community uh, based process here in Oregon. There was some consideration for ecological factors, some size and spacing, but it was also weighed off against trade offs related to potential socioeconomic impacts and also input from coastal communities and ocean users. Uh, there are two congressional bills that support our program and basically mandate um, our program to do a variety of different uh, tasks. One that I'm gonna highlight here is uh, Senate Bill 1510. Uh, and so that bill said, okay, well, this program is new for Oregon, so let's have a programmatic check-in in the year 2023. Oh, and right now it's time for that check-in. And so what does that check-in mean? Well, so basically you can see on this timeline here when the program was established kind of in late 2009, the beginning of 2010. Um, and you can see when the various harvest restrictions went into effect at the different marine reserves. Um, the Senate bill asked us to kind of summarize what we've learned in the program over the past decade. And so that uh, fortunately for us overlapped with some of the COVID years. So we spent a lot of time analyzing those data that we've been collecting, reflecting on how far our program has come um, to be able to, to share these stories uh, with Oregonians here and with the legislature. Our program underwent an independent university assessment, which uh, my colleague Will is going to talk about in a couple of minutes here. Um, and that assessment is also contributing to part of this uh, legislative check-in happening right now. And some of the recommendations that came from that assessment have led to the development of a new uh, House bill for consideration during this session. So. Some of the good stuff. What have we learned after 10 years uh, of developing the Marine Reserves Program here in Oregon? Well, we've learned how to develop nearshore sampling tools. Uh, you know that uh, Oregon coast environment is full of energy, can be some rough conditions. And so what we did was we looked at uh, monitoring that was happening in other West Coast areas and adapted them to working here on the Oregon coast. We did this for both ecological monitoring and also our socioeconomic monitoring. And this has led to a lot of robust data sets for tracking different types of ecosystem change. So fish and invertebrates and algae communities um, at multiple different sites across the coast. Uh, for us to really understand how these areas are changing over time uh, and what that means for our uh, communities here off the coast. And so far, we've been able to see that we are meeting our, our goal of, uh, you know, protecting different types of biodiversity because we see we're protecting different types of communities. So this is a graph here across four of the marine reserves where we use this one particular survey tool called a hook and line where we take volunteers out to do fishing for science surveys. And we can see, oh, I'll hit that stop sharing button, sorry. Um, we can see across the coast here um, that uh, black rockfish make up the majority of the catch across these four marine reserve sites. But when we start to zero in on some of the other species, for example, canary rockfish represented by orange here on the graphs, we can see that not all marine reserve sites have the same amount of canary rockfish. And in particular with China rockfish, you know, there's one marine reserve that, you know, has quite a bit of uh, China rockfish catch compared to the others. Uh, and this is true for invertebrates as well. So we can look to compare purple urchins, which is that purple here uh, across the bars. We see different amounts of purple urchins across our invertebrate communities at some of the sites. Um, we can also look at their predators, uh, like the ochre sea star, uh, and see how those levels also vary across the reserves. And we can also try and look at other different invertebrates that we observe and collect with our different monitoring tools. This is an example of the burrowing sea cucumber, and we can see that there are different um, densities of this species across the site. Hey, Lindsay, hey, I don't, I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't believe your screen share is working. We oh, just have a video of you for the past couple of minutes. So oh I apologize. I, I think one of our hosts probably missed that. Sorry about that.
All right, here's that graph that talks about the urchins. It's associated with that purple color. It, they're different across the marine reserve sites. And the same is true for sea stars uh, and also for burrowing sea cucumbers. Uh, so you can see the communities are different across the coast here. Um, so far, we're on track with our expectations about change over time in these different areas. We know that it's too soon to attribute changes uh, to putting these restricted areas in place yet, mostly because the species that live off our coast here are very long lived. Um, and so that means their population numbers change very slowly over time. But we are currently tracking changes at both marine reserve sites and in comparison area sites um, where fishing and ocean development are allowed. So this is uh, a graph showing uh, settlement rate in one of the marine reserves in comparison to an area outside. And you can see that the lines here trend very closely together. So we're tracking changes and we're mostly seeing similar changes so far. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about our Human Dimensions uh, Research Program, which focuses on social, economic, and cultural research associated with these areas on our coast. And so the types of questions that we kind of study with this type of research and monitoring are trying to understand the economic impacts on fishermen and local communities from putting in these restricted areas off the coast trying to understand what these social impacts are. And so when I say social impacts, I really mean things like trust and conflict and changes in relationships, opportunities for dialogue. Um, and then since, again, this is a new sort of tool in the management toolbox for Oregonians, trying to understand people's knowledge, attitudes, and support for marine reserves over time. And the current challenge for our program is that now that we've looked at all of these things, we're really trying to understand what impacts are the most important and who decides what impacts are the most important. Um, so just similar to that ecological side of the house where we kind of had to develop the methods, we had to do the same thing for understanding social and economic change. And what we found is that the impacts vary across different scales and across different sectors or stakeholders in the community. We know that how communities differ on the coast in terms of their characteristics are linked to different impacts we see. So for example, these photos are photos about access uh, from different ports up and down the coast to the closest marine reserve. So access looks different. We also know that commercial and recreational Fishing opportunities look different at these places across the coast, as do sort of the values of, uh, you know, different recreational sites of, of activities. So maybe we want to know specifically what the economic impacts are on fishers. The short answer is that it's complicated. And this makes sense because we've been exploring these impacts at multiple scales. So it can't just be summed up in one simple answer. Um, so we can think about, you know, if there was a very dramatic economic impact, we would see it at sort of the largest level of exploration, you know, at the state level. But impacts might look different if we consider one particular commercial fishing industry or maybe a recreational fishing industry. Maybe these impacts look different if we're thinking about a different geographical location, like different ports on the coast, or even down at an individual level. And so far, what we've seen is statewide financial effects were not substantial from putting in these um, marine reserves off of our coast here. But that's because of the way that our fishing industry is made up here in Oregon. We have fishermen that fish up in Alaska. They fish in areas that are further offshore of the coast. And so um, by putting these restricted areas in the waters that are closest to shore in only about 9% of state waters, again, at that largest level, there were not substantial impacts economically. We've learned that some fisheries are more vulnerable than others. So for example, the nearshore ground fish fishery is one of the fisheries in Oregon that's uh, more impacted than others. And that's because they target species that live in these habitats closest to shore that don't move very much. 
and sort of the ports that rely on these fisheries are really in the most economically vulnerable communities. So you can maybe think of the different economic opportunities, say between Garibaldi versus Newport. So I'm going to switch to talking a little bit just about in some of our results related to social impacts. And what we really see are a bunch of different trade-offs. Uh, you know, so the marine reserves have caused uncertainty for some people in how they make business decisions, you know, for the future of their business. Uh, some people have talked about unmet expectations, promises of research contracts, you know, that, that never appeared. However, there's also positive social impacts, like the reserves have created opportunities for dialogue. And we've really been able to identify common concerns about the ocean across multiple different stakeholder groups. And so, again, one of the questions is how do you sort of weigh off these social impacts, say, versus economic impacts? Do they have the same weight? Since our program was new, so what have we learned about support for our program over time? Well, we see that it is increasing from the early years of the program uh, through to the later years. Uh, and also that opposition is decreasing. This is a graph that shows different types of stakeholders, again, surveyed about their opposition to our program. And we can see across all the stakeholder groups that opposition has declined. Again, I just want to touch on that research mandate that we have. Our program is doing research that matters to Oregonians. So we're providing data uh, that's informing stock assessments here in Oregon, like the Cabazon 2019 stock assessment, where we contribute data from some of our juvenile fish monitoring and from a, the, those independent, fishery independent hook and line surveys. We're also contributing data to emerging issues like um, threats to different sea star species from sea star wasting disease. One in particular, the sunflower sea star has just recently been listed on kind of a global threatened species list as being critically endangered. And that's the sunflower sea star. Our socioeconomic program also contributes data to other nearshore management issues, such as providing economic uh, impact models for consideration of reintroducing sea otters and information about knowledge and awareness to uh, ocean acidification and hypoxia. Again, I mentioned our program has created opportunities to collaborate with the fishing industry um, in multiple different ways, especially on the north and south coast uh, where these opportunities didn't exist before. And we know that these aren't just paper parks. Enforcement is happening. Uh, OSP is out there, uh, you know, making sure people are following the rules. We're also finding that there's buy-in from the fishing community themselves and from the local community. People are calling in reports to the TIP hotline. Um, and so it's really a community effort to kind of make sure that there's some teeth behind these restricted areas here in the ocean. Um, a lot of this work wouldn't be possible sort of with engaging different communities uh, without our communications uh, outreach and engagement staff member. There's been development of a website, um, you know, branding associated with our program, newsletters, social media posts, outreach activities related to um, our program and kind of sharing what we've learned. Uh, we've been able to partner with 37 different institutions and provide volunteer opportunities to get people out there engaged with some of uh, the scientific monitoring. Uh, and just again to highlight that really it's our state's invested resources and staff have been able to attract additional investment by various partner institutions and so just highlighting that in each of the marine reserves, there have been different sort of, you know, friends groups and organizations that have rallied around these areas, you know, bringing in additional funding, additional engagement, additional participation to really making these areas feel like a sense of place. And so that's uh, sort of the, the end of my time to share with you about our marine reserves program. And I think we're holding questions until the end, but um, thank you for listening.
Great. So thank you, Lindsay. I appreciate it. Uh, I think we will now go to Will to talk about some of the current research that has come out of the Marine Reserve Program. Great. Thanks very much. Yes, and thanks a lot for the invitation to uh, to speak today. I'm really excited to uh, share some of this uh, information with the new audience. Um, so as Lindsay just explained, uh, where we are sort of <clears throat> in the timeline in the history of Oregon's Marine Reserves Program, back when they were uh, created and first implemented, there was a legislative mandate to evaluate them, um, beginning with the preparation of a synthesis report by ODFW in 2021. And then the legislation, uh, also specified that that report that ODFW prepared, a sort of self-report, should be evaluated by an outside group led by university scientists to, uh, to evaluate how well they're meeting the, those legislative goals and make recommendations to the legislature for what the future of the Marine Reserves Program should be. And so that, uh, that happened in 2022, and uh, I was the, the uh, university researcher who led that evaluation uh, process along with a team of other experts in various dimensions of marine science uh, and human dimension science. Um, so that assessment uh, was prepared back in uh, the spring and summer of last year and has now been uh, transmitted to the legislature. And I believe Charlie is going to be talking about some of the legislation that's going forward based on those recommendations. And so the goals of the reserve that we were evaluating and that ODFW has been striving to achieve uh, as Lindsay said, we're to conserve marine habitats and biodiversity, to support research and monitoring, and to avoid uh, significant adverse socioeconomic impacts. I do want to spend a few minutes just talking about that second point of supporting scientific research, because a number of really great things have happened in the reserves program based on the research that, they, that the ODFW and their partners was able to, to conduct over the past 10 years. Um, and some of the research I'll be telling you about was done primarily by ODFW, some by academic partners, you know, researchers at Oregon State, University of Oregon, Portland State University, uh, and some was done collaboratively with, uh, with members of the, of the coastal community. I'm not gonna get too particular about which, you know, who was leading which program, I just wanna mention sort of an overview. The great thing about marine reserve programs like the one here in Oregon is that they provide an opportunity for long-term research. We, as long as we have uh, uh, the support, the financial support to go out and look at what's happening in these marine communities and compare them to what's happening outside of reserves and marine protected areas, then we have the opportunity to detect changes. And sometimes that allows us to detect unexpected events. So for example, um, th these are data from uh, inside and outside of uh, the Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve down on the South Coast, uh, showing trends in uh, two really key important members of the Rocky Reef community, the Sunflower Sea Star and the Purple Urchin. And in the 2014-2015 in the period, a series of really important stressors happened to this marine ecosystem. We had a marine heat wave, which was a period of warmer than usual water for several years that really changed the productivity of that ecosystem and damaged a lot of the uh, organisms that are adapted and acclimated to colder waters. And there was this uh, epizootic disease that killed off a number of the different sea, sea star species, including the sunflower sea star. Uh, it turns out that sunflower sea stars are really important predators of purple urchins. Purple urchins, in turn, are a really important herbivore that grazes on, uh, on kelp. And so this, um, this loss of the sunflower star led to an increase, we think, in purple urchins, uh, and that's in turn put, put undue stress on our kelp forests off the coast of Oregon. Um, as Lindsay mentioned, the, the research like this, documenting these patterns of change, have led to uh, uh, that sunflower sea star being listed by the IUCN as a critically endangered species. And actually just today, uh, NOAA put forward a petition to list the sunflower sea star as an endangered species under the, the Federal Endangered Species Act. So that process is ongoing. Um, and the reason I wanted to highlight this is because these are things that you don't detect unless you're in the water all the time. You know, we didn't necessarily know that that epizootic was going to happen. And so it's only because we had data already in hand that we were monitoring before um, that that change happened, that we were able to, to detect that change. So having those sort of time series is really, really valuable. And I just wanted to give a shout out to groups like the Oregon Kelp Alliance that are now doing really important work to try to find ways to restore kelp forests in Oregon by trying to manage that predator prey. Uh, 
interaction. Another really valuable thing about, about the types of monitoring and research that you can do in marine reserves is understand ecological responses to climate change. So a really important concern here in Oregon is coastal hypoxia. So as uh, uh, upwelling winds in the spring and summer um, drive the surface layer of water offshore and bring cool nutrient rich water up from the up from deeper parts of the ocean, that's a really important uh, driver of the productivity of our coastal ocean. But that deep water is increasingly low in oxygen, uh, both because of sort of general global um, global warming of the ocean that reduces the amount of oxygen that's in in uh, ocean waters, and because of changes in the in the way that oxygen is consumed by organisms in the in the plankton. And so, increasingly, have these patterns of events, and this is data from uh, inside and outside of the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve, showing the dissolved oxygen near the bottom of the uh, near the bottom of the seafloor. Um, and you see that this uh, the 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 uh, oxygen fluctuates over the course of the summer and often dips down to this limit that we know is a is a sort of physiological tolerance limit for a lot of uh, a lot of organisms. By having that record and also having the types of monitoring that goes on in marine reserves, you can tell whether the species in the reserves, like rockfishes or like lingcod, are responding to those hypoxic events by leaving, by changing their distribution, and things like that. So being able to have both the ecological monitoring and this physical monitoring is really helping us understand the way Oregon's ecosystems are responding to climate change. Um, and that's, you know, Oregon has, has made this a priority and there's a, a state council on ocean acidification and hypoxia that makes recommendations for how we can uh, carry on this research. Um, another opportunity that, that happens inside marine reserves is an ability to detect new threats to co coastal ecosystems. So with uh, going along with some of the hook and line sampling that was done, um, uh, researchers were able to collect black rockfish and look inside their tissues to see if they were being exposed to uh, microfiber and microplastic pollution. And sure enough, they are. So there's uh, 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 up and down the coast, there are different levels of, of incidence of um, both plastic pollution and natural fiber pollution. So, so like uh, laundry lint essentially is getting into our coastal oceans. Uh, and so being able to do the sampling to detect that statewide impact is really important to detect the potential harm that that type of pollution could be causing. Um, and in fact, there's, uh, in part because of some of this evidence that we have uh, concerns about fibers entering the environment, there's actually another um, legislative bill that's being considered right now that would uh, recommend the, the uh, use of filters on washing machines to reduce the amount of these types of fibers that can enter our marine ecosystems. And then uh, lastly, in this part of the talk, I just wanted to point out that, that another really great opportunity we have with the reserves program is the potential for collaborative research with members of the coastal community, with members of the fishing fleet. Uh, and so there was an example of some work that was done down at uh, the Redfish Rocks Reserve in the South Coast, where a, a cooperative fishing effort was done to uh, monitor the movement of rockfishes, like this China rockfish, to find out how much they moved. And it turns out that they these are very sedentary animals that don't have very large home ranges, which means that they'd be very effectively protected by the types of reserves we have in Oregon. They, they, don't, they don't tend to stray outside of the boundaries of the reserve where they could be caught. Um, and I did wanna give a shout out. Lindsay showed a brief uh, glimpse of this really cool data dashboard that they have. But if you follow that URL, um, ODFW has done a great job of taking all of the data that they've been collecting in the reserves and putting them online so they're really accessible and easy to use and you can you know pick your favorite reserve and see what's been going on in there and look at what's happening to the fish and the invertebrates and and all the different uh, members of the ecological community okay so getting back to this uh, the assessment process i wanted to spend some time talking about that so remembering that these goals of conserving diversity supporting research and avoiding socioeconomic impacts when we evaluated the report that ODFW had put together of uh, documenting their 10 years of work, uh, the key takeaway was that, yeah, in general, the Oregon Marine Reserves Program has, has met those goals. They were effectively designed and implemented, and, and they're achieving those legislative goals uh, and the objectives that were set forth by uh, what we call OPAC, which is the, uh, the Ocean Policy Advisory Council here in Oregon, which is a team of scientific experts. Um, and so our key recommendation to the legislature is that it's now time for that reserves program to enter the adaptive management phase. So it's been designed and implemented, and ODFW has spent the last 10 years really fine-tuning the way they monitor 
uh, these marine ecosystems. You know, different there's different challenges in each marine reserve, and so they have to use slightly different methods to monitor different types, different parts of the community, whether it's uh, the you know the subtidal rocky reefs, whether it's softer bottoms, whether it's the intertidal. And so now that all that fine tuning has been done, we can really enter sort of a more mature phase of the reserves program um, with ongoing monitoring. Um, being able to uh, make predictions about when we should see certain ecological goals. Um, and we're also saying that as part of the adaptive management process, uh, we'll need a little bit better guidance from policymakers about how to evaluate some of these socioeconomic impacts. So I did want to take a few minutes to talk about what adaptive management is. So adaptive management is a cycle in policymaking where we make predictions about what a particular action would have, you then monitor the results, and then you evaluate whether the, the action that we took met the expectations that we had. Uh, and so this is a pretty simple idea. This is just, this is almost the way that we, we cook food, right? Imagine you're making a pot of soup and you think, well, it's not salty enough. I'll add a teaspoon of salt and see if that works. So you, you make an action, you make a prediction that you only need a teaspoon. You then taste the soup to see if, you've, uh, if, if it meets expectations. And then you can adjust what you do next based on whether it's salty enough now or not. Right? And that's the same thing that we do with policy and adaptive management. The first thing we need to do is, is make those predictions. Um, and so in making predictions about what reserves can do, we need to think about, about the, the actual ecological effects that we can expect to see inside of reserves. So Oregon's reserves, the, the primary things that they do is they prevent harvest of fish and vertebrates, uh, and they prevent destructive activities like um, uh, any kind of uh, development of uh, energy structures or things like that on the, on the seafloor. So that means that they ensure intact habitats. And to the extent that there was a lot of fishing beforehand, we could expect the fish populations to build up and we, we should be getting more and older fish because when fish aren't harvested, they live longer. Right? Uh, but we have to realize that there's always a balancing act between protecting biodiversity, which effectively means restricting more and more areas from fishing versus minimizing the economic impact, which is another goal of the reserves program. Um, and so if we think about ecologically what we can expect to, to see happen, um, there's always going to be a, a, an effect of how much fishing was happening in a reserve beforehand on how much change you can expect to see. And so this is a graph from a, a, an article I wrote, well, 10 years ago now, um, that makes that ecological prediction showing that if we have time after reserve is put into place in years on the horizontal axis and the relative change in fish abundance on the vertical axis. So one would be no change, things are staying the same, two would be a doubling. Uh, and then these three colored lines are showing three different levels of fishing effort that was happening before the reserve got put into place from relatively low to much, much higher. And the more fishing that was happening before, the more that fish population was depressed and the more potential it has to respond. It happens that in Oregon, um, we chose many of the sites for reserves to be places where there'd be minimal effect on fishing. And so that's, um, that's what's expected, right? We don't expect to see a big change because we're not, we're not removing a ton of fishing from that part of the system. And that's something that, uh, that Lindsay noted in her presentation as well. It's also the case that even when we do expect to see some changes, smaller changes are more difficult to, to detect because it's a, a very complex system and there's lots of variability just from day to day and how many fish you might expect to see out on, out on a given, uh, in a given uh, reef. So that means that there's, we need more effort put into, uh, into our monitoring programs. So uh, our recommend, recommendation to the legislature was for an adaptive management plan that has realistic goals, right? We, we need to have realistic expectations for how much change in these fish populations we can expect to see. Uh, and that's going to vary from reserve to reserve based on the history of those locations and what was happening in them before they became reserves. The next step in the adaptive management cycle is to monitor results. And so that's going to require ongoing long-term monitoring. Um, ODFW uses what is considered to be the gold standard of the way you should monitor marine reserves, which is called a before-after control impact design. And that just means that you pick a place, you pick two locations on the coast, one of which is a place that becomes a reserve where you stop fishing, and one is a place that is that continues to be uh, to be fished. So we have a place that's a control where nothing changes and a place where we've made a change. And we monitor those locations before uh, big changes are expected and then going forward through time. So we were able to see 
whether changes are due to just environmental factors that might be the same in both locations or whether they're really due to the reserves. And the key thing is that those changes have to be monitored continually over time. We can't just wait another 10 years, then go back out and see what's happened. We need to be monitoring over the entire time. And that's because environmental disturbances like another marine heat wave can really disrupt what's happening in both the, uh, the fish location and in the reserve and might make us uh, misunderstand the results of the monitoring program because they could, if, if we see um, fish biomass changing over time, and then we happen to monitor uh, right after a big disturbance event, we might think that the reserves are not working very effectively. Whereas if we'd been monitoring throughout the entire time, we'd see those sequence of events and understand that a pattern was due to the heat wave, not due to ineffective reserve management. Right? And so this leads to another recommendation that there needs to be funding to ODFW to support that type of ongoing monitoring to support the type of research that I was showing you earlier in this talk. Okay, and then the final step is that there needs to be the scope to evaluate and adjust what's going on. If we decide that we need to have different enforcement, or if we need to decide that the, the boundaries of reserves should be shifted or something like that, that's what the data, that, that could be a data informed decision moving forward, um, but also ultimately a policy decision. And the idea I wanna leave you with is that um, going forward, there's a big question about what reserves can do for Oregon's coastal ecosystem. And one of the big, um, hopes is that in the face of ongoing global climate change, that reserves might find, might be uh, in some way providing resilience against climate change, right? Um, they might be able to either reduce the impacts of a, of, a, of a climate disturbance like a heat wave or like a hypoxic event, or sh shorten the time it takes for the, an ecosystem to rebound from that disturbance. Okay, there are a few different ways that could happen. Um, it's possible that in some cases, reserves could support different, uh, more diverse food webs so that um, uh, if one species is lost like a sea star, there might be another species that comes in and can feed on sea urchins and reduce impacts on kelp forests. It's also the case that to the extent that reserves protect fish from fishing, we get larger populations of fish and, and just bigger fish in general because they live longer and they get big. And that means that they make more babies. And so we have more reproduction and faster growth rates in the population. So if things get knocked down, it can bounce back faster. Um, these are all hypoth hypothesized effects. We're not sure if these things could happen. And so we need ongoing research and partnerships between ODFW and academic researchers like, like we've been seeing for the last 10 years to find out how Oregon's reserves could contribute to climate resilience. And so, um, I'm going to leave you with this and I think kick it over to, to Charlie, who's going to talk more about the legislative side of things. But these are our recommendations that, that Oregon should be supporting the adaptive management of their marine reserves. And they should be setting realistic expectations and also funding this, this monitoring that's leading to ongoing science. Um, because Oregon really is poised to be a leader in, at the forefront of marine reserve science and understanding how marine reserves interact with climate change to protect coastal ecosystems. I will stop there and turn it over to Charlie. All right, uh, thanks Will and uh, Environment uh, Oregon for inviting me to present today. Um, I actually have the, the easy part here, um, less the science and um, all the, the programmatic mandates and to, to help get you excited about these areas. And they asked me to talk a little bit about what makes them special. Um, and I figure the best way to talk about what makes these areas special is actually see the areas and look at the areas. So I'm going to attempt to do a video uh, tour of the marine reserves. And I think I'm going to stop my video just so we're only running one video at a time. And I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. All right. Is that coming through? Can folks see that? Give me a thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, well, we'll start our tour on the, the south end. I'm going to go through all five marine reserves here. And one of the reasons I, I, I think visuals are really important is because these, these areas, you can think of these as underwater parks. Um, we're really familiar with the parks on land. Uh, we get to visit them. Uh, we might picnic in them. Um, so we spend a lot of time in them. You can drive through them. Uh, a lot of people hunt and fish in these areas. Um, in our ocean, it's a lot less accessible for individuals. So a lot of people look out at the ocean 
occasionally just see uh, just a blue slate. Um, and so connecting to these underwater parks uh, is challenging sometimes for individuals. And honestly, that's one of the benefits of the Marine Reserve Program. All the research um, on all the work is bringing a lot of visuals and a lot of information um, that can uh, be seen by the public. So you can kind of see beneath the surface and you understand that, you know, Oregon doesn't stop at the beach. And you know, we have three miles offshore here of fantastic habitat, um, some unparalleled uh, animals and species and ecosystems. And uh, they're worthy of your um, appreciation. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to, to show some of these things. Um, and thank you to the Marine Reserve Program uh, for all their work. A lot of this visuals that you're seeing is actually coming directly from them. So our tour is going to start on the south end of the coast uh, at Redfish Rocks. Redfish Rocks is uh, this, one of the smaller marine reserves at 2.6 miles square. Um, and it sits uh, just south of Port Orford. Um, so that's on the southern Oregon coast. This was um, one of the marine reserves that was actually, let's see if I can close that out. There we go. Um, that was actually designated by fishermen. Um, it's represented by a lot of rocky reef habitat, more rocky reef habitat than pretty much any of the other marine reserves. Very, very diverse um, uh, fish species and assemblages here at this spot. One of my favorite places on the Oregon coast, there's lots of emergent reefs, lots of emergent rocks, very, very diverse and deep, deep collaboration with the fishing community to do the research in, in this area. So some of the things you're looking at now, these are some some of the uh, Dungeness crabs scurrying around, some of the mixed habitat, the sandy habitat. Oh, I'm going to stop this video just uh, before we go north to the next marine reserves and just wrap up that um, this, this area um, is represented by a unique bioregion as well. So different from all the other marine reserves, that's going to be a theme as I kind of go through this. They're all very, very unique in their, in their, their right. And um, this one is, is, is at a, at a bioregion south of Cape Blanco, which makes the assemblages of animals and species um, and the ecosystems um, a bit different than that uh, to the areas to the north, which, which is important um, because if we're trying to do these areas um, and, and designating these areas for protection and conservation, we don't all want our eggs in one basket. We kind of want to diversify um, and have different areas represented. So that's one of the reasons why um, having diverse habitats in different areas represented is really important and why it's important that these are all unique areas. So we'll fly a little bit further north here um, to the Cape Perpetua Marine Reserve. The Cape Perpetua Marine Reserve represents our largest marine reserve on the Oregon coast at 14 miles square. Um, it is situated between Yahats and Florence. And so it's along that amazing stretch um, that many people know for uh, the protections on shore. Uh, we have some brilliant um, forest and other um, parks that that um, run right up to this, this area. Um, it's bordered on the north and the south by uh, actually three protected areas. And it has the deepest reef um, of all the marine reserves, very, very deep reef. And most of the habitat in Cape Perpetua is dominated though by sand uh, and gravel. So that uh, means that we're probably protecting a lot of the soft bottom habitat areas here. Um, there's a lot of crab in this area. We've noticed um, this is a dynamic spot for upwelling and hypoxia. And so we do a lot of uh, research here um, on hypoxia and the effects of ocean acidification. Uh, you can see this is that deep, deep reef um, that is hard, um, unique from other sites. You can't scuba dive on this reef for very long. And so um, the way they research this is, is pre predominantly with the ROV, whereas at some other sites, you'll see scuba is a major part of how they investigate the site. Um, so uh, there is ooh, a sunflower sea star right there. I'm just going to stop it because that is a endangered species now. Um, and uh, you can see some of the sandy bottom habitat that we're flying over here. Those two lasers that you see, the, the red lines, those are lasers that help us measure uh, things underwater. So that's the ROV uh, and the video sled swim across the bottom there. They have these uh, lasers that allow them to measure what's on the bottom. Um, so they can go back and um, believe it or not, ODF and W spends hundreds and hundreds of hours going through each of those videos, slowing them down um, and then counting the number of species and understanding what is represented on the bottom and measuring them. And so those uh, tools help them in measuring different species and understanding what's on the bottom. So moving north, 
up to our smallest marine reserve, the Otter Rock Marine Reserve. This is another area um, that was designated by the fishing community. Uh, it was the fishing community to the north in, um, in oops, there we go. It was a fishing community to the north in Depot Bay that uh, designated this area or recommended it for a designation. Um, a lot of that was to avoid some of the significant areas that they fished. Uh, Outer Rock is situated between Depot Bay and Newport, and a lot of people understand this area for the park that's associated there, Devil's Punch Bowl, and the tremendous tide pool environment that exists um, around that area. So as we zoom in a little bit, you can see the assemblages there. It does have a, a mixed gravel and rocky reef. Um, it has, uh, it's bordered by, on the north and the south, by emergent rocks. Um, again, we can see um, here looking at some of the underwater video, this is a, these are mycid shrimp that you see, and there's a, looks like a pile perch or a surf perch uh, swimming by, and some great cameos from, this is a video lander, here's our cameo, video landers uh, different from ROVs, they drop them on the bottom, and they wait to see what moves around, and if you're watching carefully there in the corner of your screen, you'll see the Pacific red octopus, one of my favorite animals, mobilizing in that area. So this is a really important area um, in the Marine Reserve Program for learning and testing out new tools. It is the shallowest of the marine reserves, um, which makes it great for, oh, we see a little bird swimming by there, um, which makes it great for um, testing out new types of um, survey techniques and testing out new tools as closest to shore. Um, so some things about that marine reserve make it easier. Some parts about that reserve and that it's really shallow make it difficult and that it's hard to get a big ship in there. You can't drag an ROV or, or swim an ROV through those shallow areas. Um, so they do rely a lot more on scuba diving and other techniques to like the video lander to understand what is happening on the bottom there and researching those areas. So moving north uh, to Cascade Head. Cascade Head is... Um, uh, 10 miles square just off of Lincoln City. It's situated just south of Cascade Head. And um, it is bordered by uh, marine protected areas on the north, south, and the west. Uh, this um, area uh, represents significant rocky reef habitat that is utilized um, or was utilized by the, the charter fishing industry out of Depot Bay um, and other nearshore fisheries. And so a lot of recreational fishing and the charter fishing industry utilized this area prior to designation. So it's one of the areas where we might see, like redfish rocks, some changes in the ecological uh, assemblages based on fishing prior to and fishing after these areas were designated. Um, as you learned from, from Will's presentation, we can, we can depend on things looking different um, depending on how much fishing was happening in these areas prior. So now you're seeing, you all heard about sea cucumbers in, I think, uh, Lindsay's presentation. These are uh, lots of sea cucumbers on the, the, the seafloor. And then these are baby Dungeness crabs swimming around. Um, and they had just settled out. And that was a pretty cool thing to catch on camera. So now we're going to move north up to our northernmost marine reserve, which is Cape Falcon. Cape Falcon. Falcon is 12 miles square and is situated off of the magnificent Oswald West State Park. Um, Oswald West and Light Cape Perpetua really exemplifies this land-sea connection. And we know that a lot of the things that we do on land impacts our um, adjacent uh, ocean areas. And so it's significant that we protected areas that also have landward and, and um, landward protections. And so um, this area, I think a lot of people are familiar with. Um, the, the state park there, there's a lot of individuals that like to, to utilize this area for uh, recreation, surfing, um, beach going, very, very popular area on the North Coast. It's also situated within the Columbia River Plume, um, which means that it receives all the nutrients and potentially the bad things that come down from the Columbia River. So another unique site. Um, the assemblages of rocky reef here um, don't hold uh, as many fish as some of the other areas like Cascade Head and Redfish Rocks, but we still see a lot of, oops, stop the video there. We still see a lot of black rockfish, which is, as you saw in Lindsay's presentation, one of the fish species that really dominate 
dictates a lot of the reserve sites. Um, so that's the, the end of the presentation um, for the reserves and the, each of the sites. I do want to thank um, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and Oregon State Parks and then also the Oregon Marine Reserves Partnership um, for all the footage that we were able to see in the video. And with that, if you have oh, I'm going to stop and hopefully start a PowerPoint. All right, I think that can be seen. Everybody see that? Okay. Yep. I can't see anybody, so I'm just gonna. Yeah, Charlie, that looks great. Thank you. Uh, and I'll go ahead and start up my video here as well. Um, so now moving along, I wanna just kind of quickly go over uh, what's next for the Marine Reserve Program, what the legislation is doing, kind of building off of what we heard from Lindsay and Will. Um, looks like, there we go. Um, we've touched on some of these stats already, so I'm not going to re-represent this information. But I do want to go back to why we did this in the first place, um, which is conservation, research, and communities. Those were the key kind of goals around Oregon's marine reserves and protected areas. And really, it was that last bucket, communities, and um, that really mattered the most when it came to um, how we make decisions about marine reserves. Conservation is important to everyone. Research is important to everyone, but it is how conservation and research interacts with people that really matters. And so that's 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 a big learning lesson, actually, I think, for a lot of individuals who do planning for marine reserves and, and also for the state of Oregon, because oftentimes we approach this from a very ecological angle um, or very research need angle. And um, it's much, much more dynamic than that. Uh, we, have, we have lots of needs and, and lots of um, people and communities are a big part of Oregon's marine reserve system. Um, so as we think about people and community and we think about the recommendations that came um, from Will White, um, we, we picked up this year with uh, uh, House Bill 2903. Um, House Bill 2903 uh, makes five key recommendations. Um, some that came directly from Will White's team who did the 10-year the assessment um, and some from the synthesis report that the um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife put together. But the first and foremost recommendation is to fund the program. Um, as you guys may know, we oftentimes have a hard time funding our natural resource agencies, and that's no different with the Marine Reserve Program. The Marine Reserve Program was uh, additionally uh, uh, originally allocated $1.8 million and six staff, which is a pretty small budget and a very, very small staff to um, set up these areas, manage these areas, set up the monitoring, um, the enforcement, do the research. Um, it, it's a very, very, what we would call an austere budget uh, and austere staff. And so one of the problems throughout the 10 years was that the budget was rarely all there. And so when the legislature is often looking times to make cuts or when the pandemic happens and we do salary freezes, that has an impact on the program. And in fact, this year, the governor's recommended budget cut the community program leader position. And if you haven't heard anything yet from all of our presentations, I hope that you gather that the community and the engagement of the communities is critically important. Um, so number one for us, this legislative session, besides the new recommendations is to fully fund the program and what it was originally allocated to do. Um, and so right now we are working within the Ways and Means who will hear Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's budget next week to try and get them to reinstate that position that was cut from the governor's budget. The second recommendation around funding the program um, is to add two more staff members and a fellow, um, raising the full budget to $2.6 million. And the rationale for that it has to do with all the mandates um, that might come out of the other recommendations. So other recommendations you heard from Will, mandate an adaptive management program, right? So now we understand a little, little bit about what that means for the Marine Reserves. Um, it's an idea that really needs to be worked through. There's a process where we have to work with the communities, um, understanding what we have today, what's in place, and how we're going to use these areas and the science from these areas 
um, to better meet the needs of tomorrow. So we're faced with a lot of uh, uncertainty in our ocean. We have climate change, we have sea level rise, and we have a lot of adaptation that we as ocean community that depends on natural resources in, in the ocean and fishers, we have to adapt. And we can use the Marine Reserve Program to help us adapt, but that means making the Marine Reserves and the program adaptable. The third recommendation is to define collaboration and a process for science to inform policy. And that sounds a little wonky, um, but the reality is, is, you know, we need to understand how these areas and the science coming out of these areas can benefit Oregonians and can help us change and make policy decisions um, around people. So, for example, when we're thinking about is an area um, that we protect, is it, uh, is it displacing too many fishermen? Um, well, we found out that uh, overall our, our, our marine reserves and protected areas are, are not causing too much displacement or financial harm on the fishing industry. But if we get a little bit more granular with that, we can see that maybe one individual was impacted or another. So how do we use science and how do we understand that data to inform future siting of marine reserves or how do we understand um, how to best avoid economic and uh, socioeconomic impacts while also providing conservation opportunities. The fourth recommendation um, really gets at defining a process for consideration of future marine reserves. And this really came from the um, Coastal Caucus, which are the legislators along the coast that, um, that were responsible for uh, often receiving the, the um, the assessment and turning it into the legislation that you see today. So they took the top three recommendations and then added a couple of their own. And this really has to do with the Oregon way. A lot of individuals um, concerned about um, how marine reserves are decided in the future. We wanna make sure that we have all Oregon stakeholders at the table, which means both conservation community, but also representatives from the fishing community, individuals from tribes, individuals from various different user groups on the Oregon coast are critical for us in deciding how we're going to um, adaptively manage the program and consider the future of marine reserves. And the last recommendation really was around um, ensuring that communities benefit from the marine reserve science. So we're starting to see that already, um, but really the uh, 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 adding another position, an applied research position to help um, will we'll help, uh, excuse me, adding an applied research position will help us uh, get at how do we take data and inform fisheries so that we can improve fisheries. Maybe extend fishery seasons or understand when we need to close a fishery or when we need to worry about ocean acidification impacting um, a, a, a crab fishery or another fishery. Um, so these are sort of the key recommendations that are coming out of House Bill 2903. And um, with that, I think we can stop and go to our questions. Great, thanks, Charlie. We appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today about that. Um, if anyone has questions, please drop them in the chat. We have about one, one and a half minutes left and I'll be sending a follow-up email to everyone that attended today um, with my email. Um, so you can get in touch with me and I can circulate any questions we have to uh, our panelists. Um, but we'll give it a second. I don't think we have any questions in the chat um, as of yet. So I think we can wrap up here. Um, and again, I appreciate everyone for coming and huge thank you to all the panelists today. This was uh, really great.